You see me making a coffee, you see me enjoying a coffee, and you want a coffee. I'm a pastor here in Calgary at Commons Church, but in my spare time and in my academic work, I've spent a lot of time working with the writings and the theories of René Girard. And you will see those ideas pop up if you watch our sermons, if you're part of our community, you will hear a lot of Girard's ideas and his name dropped from time to time. And he's a really interesting theorist, a really interesting theologian. But a lot of people have expressed to me that Girard, as fascinating as he is, can be kind of inaccessible. Especially the primary sources on Girard are kind of hard to get into because they're so expansive. And so many of his theories deal with so much in terms of human sociology, anthropology, religion, theology, and violence. And so what I wanted to do was put together a bit of a series of videos to give you at least a basic introduction to who Girard is, uh, how I interact with his ideas, and then probably most importantly, how they play out in terms of how we're doing theology in our local context here at Commons Church. And so in this video, I wanna talk about desire, where it comes from and how it drives us as human beings. After that, we'll talk about scapegoating and violence, the role that it plays in human cultures and societies. And then eventually we'll move into questions of theology, religion, and how Christianity interacts with these theories and how Girard's ideas give us new lenses to think about the Christ story, our eschatology, and ultimately what it means for salvation in the kingdom of God. And these are really fascinating ideas. My contention is that Girard is going to become more and more one of the most influential theologians, um, really, of history, but certainly of the last 100 years. He passed away in 2015, and I think his ideas are gathering more and more steam because I think they address some of the really pertinent questions that Christianity is going to need to face in the 21st century and beyond. And so I'm really fascinated by Girard. I think you will be too. And I think uh, just a bit of a walkthrough of some of the core ideas can be really helpful if this is somebody that you're interested in learning more about. So let's talk about desire. Because Gerard, one of his key ideas is that as human beings, we really don't know how to desire things directly. So you see me making a coffee, you see me enjoying a coffee, and you want a coffee. It's not because necessarily you love coffee, it's because you see in me the fact that I love coffee. And you want that, you want that experience for yourself, and you triangulate that onto an object. And this happens all the time. Uh, one of the most well-worn examples that people will use when they talk about Girard's theories is to imagine putting two children in a room with a ton of toys. What will happen is that one of the children will go and pick up a toy and immediately the other child will want that toy. It doesn't matter that there's a hundred other toys to choose from. They see the first child enjoying themselves, playing, having fun, and now they want that experience. This is more than just greed or jealousy. This is how human beings learn to socialize. Uh, from the time that we're born, we are watching our parents, we're watching other children around us, we're seeing what they do and how they navigate the world and we imitate them. It's how we learn to walk, it's how we learn to speak, it's how we become human is by imitating each other and desire, according to Gerard, is no different. We see desire in someone and we learn how to imitate that thing. Now, generally, that's not really a problem. Assuming there's lots of coffee to go around, it doesn't matter that you see me having a coffee and you want a coffee. But when resources are limited, this does become a problem. When two children want the same toy, it leads to conflict. When two people want to date the same person, they're drawn into tension with each other. When people groups are competing for limited resources, inevitably there comes uh, violence and competition that arises out of this. And what Girard says is that this is the fundamental human experience. 
that we are constantly seeing each other, imitating each other, desiring what the other has, and being drawn into conflict with each other. And what this does is it limits the ability of the human species to flourish. Um, when we look at anthropology, we see that probably for long periods of the early Homo sapien story, we lived in small groups of tribal family units that were never able to grow into larger societies, cultures, cities. We would break down and we would separate and go our own way. And Girard theorizes that this is because inevitably, when groups got to a certain uh, size, the conflict would get too big, the resources would be too limited, and the only way for humans to survive would be to go their separate ways. That tension stopped them, conflict stopped them from being able to be in community with each other. And that's where human desire comes from. Now, there's a couple ways that that tension is mediated. First can be obviously the fact that resources are abundant. So if we all want the same things, but there's enough to go around, that's great. The second can be uh, mediated by differentiation. And what this is, is not only do I begin to desire uh, the thing that you have, I might begin to look at you and want to become you. And as long as we are separated by enough um, distance in our social status, uh, maybe enough distance in our geography, maybe enough distance in our place in the community, then I can feel differentiated from you and that tension is mitigated. Um, if you are very high ranking socially and I'm very low, then we're not gonna be drawn into conflict because I might desire to be like you or to be near you, but there's too many mitigating factors. It, it just can't happen. But if we get too close, if our place in society is drawn together, then inevitably we are going to begin to compete for the same things. And this is what causes society to be limited in its ability to grow beyond small social groups. Now, Girard theorizes that somewhere along the way, what we discovered was an ability to move past that tension. And this is what he calls the generative scapegoat mechanism. The idea here is that at some point, uh, a group of humans discovered that one of the ways to alleviate the tension among them was to focus all of that conflict, all of that tension onto a single scapegoat or victim. And what Girard theorizes is that this came about spontaneously. Um, it wasn't intended, uh, but somehow a social group uh, the tension was rising, the resources were limited, and somebody made a wrong move. They uh, offended somebody, they gathered too much to themselves. The group realizes that one person is uh, maybe you know a detriment to the group around them, and in anger, the group rises up and they kill that person. He calls this the first murder, the spontaneous murder. But what happens in that is that all of the underlying tensions between all of the other members of the group are let out in that moment. All of their frustration, all of their tension, all of their conflict, all of their latent violence is unleashed on that single person. And you see this all the time in social settings right now. Um, obviously, we're not going around and scapegoating and killing people, but you can imagine a scenario where a bunch of young boys are playing on a playground and they're all competing with each other naturally. There's sort of that um, desire to be, you know, the leader of the group, the alpha male. You know, they all want to be the strongest, but uh, two boys are in conflict with each other. There's this tension between them. And how do they let that out? Well, they pick on the weakest kid or the youngest kid. And what that does is it relieves the tension between them. You see this in social groups all the time. We pick on uh, a group that's outside of us. We ostracize someone who doesn't follow the rules properly. You know, uh, an example I've used before that's kind of silly but makes a lot of sense is you could get Leafs fans together and Flames fans together and they would agree on nothing. You know, hockey's a big deal here in Canada and in Calgary and in you're on your team, you hate the people who cheer for another team. But the one way that you can get Leafs fans and Flames fans together is to start talking about Edmonton Oilers fans and all of a sudden we are together against them. Now, I happen to be from Toronto and I happen to live in Calgary and so this one is extra special to me because obviously the Oilers are the worst, but this is how it goes. 
once we find a scapegoat, once we find a victim, once we find someone that we can uh, redirect all of our tension between each other toward, we kind of let that out, we laugh together, we celebrate together, we come together as a new larger group. And that this is what Girard says allows the human species to move beyond the small social family tribal unit and actually develop into societies. Girard theorizes that this is actually the hominization of the homo sapien species. And before that, we are really just uh, higher level mammals moving around in family units. But once we discover the power of a scapegoat, and we actually come together in larger groups, well, all of a sudden now we have incredible power at our fingertips because together, collectively, human beings are an incredible force for good or for evil, but we're incredibly powerful in the world. And it's our ability to take the tension that is derived from our inability to desire directly and only want things through imitation and redirect that inherent conflict that comes from that towards a scapegoat, a victim, and an outsider that allows us then to come together as larger social groups and unlock the potential within humanity. And that's a really disturbing idea in some sense, to think that everything that humanity has accomplished, everything that allows us to be at our best in terms of our ability to shape the world comes from our ability to exclude and scapegoat another. And that this is really our original sin. It's the murder of our brother. It's the ostracization of another. It's what allows us to move forward into the world with incredible power and ability to shape the world around us, but it comes from an initial murder and a sin. And because of that, we all now owe a debt to original sin. Not because somehow sin is passed down to us in a genetic way, but socially, we now live in a society that teaches us to imitate not only the desires that we see in each other's, but teaches us to imitate the generative scapegoat process that ostracizes another and derives power from it. Peace, what we call peace, our ability to live together in social harmony comes from our ability to push someone aside and outside and away. And that is, according to Girard, not only what gives us our ability to be society, but that is our original sin that every single one of us owes a debt to. Because again, the only way we become human is by imitating what we see. And every single one of us are born into a society that we imitate. A society that creates conflict by imitating desire and relieves that conflict by choosing an outsider and a scapegoat to push to the margins.